Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Monday, January 14th, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, let's take a look, see how the market is doing today. We are once again off the earlier lows, but still down today. We've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently down 104 points, the S&P 500 down 14, the NASDAQ down 52 points, and the Russell 2000 down about 13, down a bit more on a relative basis there on the small caps. Ten-year Treasury yield, a uh, little scary earlier this morning, was down uh, tacking on some losses in the yield from what we saw at the end of last week, but it has bounced back, and it is up now about a half of one basis point to 2.71%. Volatility index, I was just looking at this, I think this is the 12th or 13th consecutive day where we might see a filled candle on the volatility index, meaning that we are closing below the open, um, and that would be 12, 13 days in a row. That's quite a streak on the VIX, and of course, that is good news for the bulls if it continues. Utility is having a very rough day. We'll talk about that in a bit, but you can see utilities down 3% today. The uh, healthcare group, XLV, another defensive area down uh, almost 1%. 0.84%. Uh, technology down 0.82% today. The one group that is leading and earlier was the only sector that I saw in positive territory, the financials, XLF, up about a half of 1%. Citigroup reported earnings. This is the first of a slew of uh, earnings reports that will get the banking group, large banks, uh, later this week. But Citigroup uh, missed on their top line, beat on their bottom line. I think this is a little bit of a relief rally, uh, quite honestly. I just think that Citigroup, because it had been beaten down so much, you could see the volume it really picked up on the selling in December. I think the fact that we had a little bit of a rally and they didn't uh, come out with any major huge warning going forward, I think gave the market a little bit of relief. Um, in that utility space, PG&E, we've talked about this company in the past, recently talking about it being near support but that when you see a company like this, a lot of times you're just waiting for the next shoe to drop. Well, the next shoe dropped, and we'll talk about that. Take a look at the chart here in just a couple of minutes, but stock down almost 50% today on the heels of some pretty ugly trading the past couple of months. Aaron, start of a new week. I tell you, I'm looking at the market, and it almost seems like, do you ever see that movie Groundhog Day? Yes. <laughs> I mean, for the last three or four days, getting up red futures and then the market just kind of slowly meanders its way all the way back toward the, you know, to, to go green. And I was wondering today if it might not be a little bit different because the 10 year treasury yield was down for the third straight day. It looked like it was starting, you know, it gapped down pretty good, a few basis points. And I thought maybe this time it doesn't hold up, but so far market's holding in there pretty well. Yeah, I suppose so. I, I've been looking at that 2600 level and, you know, we failed right there. And now we're starting to come back just a little off of that. So I'm looking for lower prices into the week. I, I figured we'd have a decent week last week. We did, but I think it's time for the market to turn around. So, well, yeah. Yeah, the, those recent lows, 2,600 in the fourth quarter, that certainly is an area to watch from a short-term perspective. And then, of course, we talked about the February low close of 2581, which was never taken out to the downside until December. And now it seems like every time I look at the S&P, it's either at 2581 or 2582. Right. <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if, what to make of it, honestly. I mean, a lot of times when you look at the prior bear market breakdowns, you know, when you, we've gone from correction mode to bear markets, the rallies, it seems like they get to a point and then they just quickly roll over. And this one just seems to be very, I don't know. It's it's uh, been reluctant. Yeah, reluctant's <laughs> a good word. I think the bulls have been very resilient, mm -hmm. and you would think that the selling would start to pick up and accelerate. And obviously, somebody's buying to keep yeah. in this area. So I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just things look soft, though. I still am not feeling too good about the market this week, but I'll uh, talk more about that later. <laughs> well, we got a lot of stories and a lot of different. Uh, areas to go over today, so I'll let you take it away. Sure. Upcoming schedule. Tom's got a workshop tomorrow on identifying tops and bottoms, so I think that will be very interesting. David Keller, the mindful investor, will be joining us on Wednesday. Thursday, we have our favorite well, I shouldn't say that because the other ones will hear. <laughs> Julius DeKempen, our Mr. RRG, will be here on Thursday. Certainly one of our 
popular guests. So it should be a good week ahead. Today is, of course, Monday. So the first thing we're going to be doing after the news is Monday setups, followed by earning and earning spotlight. Where our first symbol for the 10 and 10 is going to be Cube Smart, Cube. And then we'll finish the show with a sentiment update by yours truly. Um, I, I don't think it's any surprises there, but uh, maybe you'll think so. All right, Tom, news and headlines, let's go. All right. Uh, well, there really wasn't anything in terms of economic reports today. So we're just going to start by taking a look. I annotated a chart on the 10-year Treasury yield. So let's pull that up and take a look. Um, and now this just goes back over the last uh, year or so, back since mid-January of 2018. And you can see we were generally in an uptrend. But the two key levels to the downside, when you look back from an intermediate term perspective, obviously there were some of these short-term levels that were taken out. But looking back over the course of the year, a couple of levels that stood out to me were 2.72, 2.73 back in early April, and then again about 2.77% in late May. They came off of a little bit longer downtrends, and of course those support that uh, yield support area held throughout the year until we got to the end of December. And then as the stock market was actually bouncing on December 26th, that's when the, the bounce began, the uh, bond market, the 10-year treasury, treasury yield continued dropping. So money continued rotating into treasuries while money was also rotating into the stock market. Now, some of that could have been based on the fact that we just had fewer traders uh, at the end of December, a lot of folks on vacation. But still, where we go now from here on the 10-year treasury yield, I think is pretty important. We did rally at the beginning of the year. That coincided with the market performing, stock market performing really well. And that's what I would expect. But it, as I mentioned earlier, I don't like the fact that we're rolling back over here. Although off of today's earlier low of 2.67%, we are back up over 270. So that at least temporarily, I think, is a good thing. We'll see whether or not we can clear what I believe is a very important short-term level here at about 2.73 up to 2.77. Last week, we got to 2.75, printed that black candle, and have reversed off of that back to the downside. I don't see the S&P 500 just completely taking off and clearing important price resistance areas unless we see money rotating away from the treasury market. And the way we would see that is if the yield were to break out in major fashion above this area of yield resistance. So this is one thing that I'm going to be keeping a pretty close eye on as we go forward. All right, a couple of earnings reports out. Of course, the biggie today, Citigroup, uh, one of the large banks. And, of course, we're going to get a number of the banks reporting this week. But at least today, temporarily, we're off to a decent start. Citigroup did manage to beat expectations in the fourth quarter, buck 61 versus a buck 55. I saw another uh, report that they had reported 164 versus 155. But either way, uh, the company did beat on the bottom line. Top line, they fell a little bit short, however. The uh, revenues came in $17.1 billion. The market was looking for almost $17.6 billion. So a little bit of a mixed report there. But as I said, I was looking ahead and, and trying to gather information on their guidance. And the only thing I saw is that they were still looking to meet certain guidelines going forward in 2019. So it didn't sound like any kind of a warning. And uh, if we take a look, uh, Shaw Communications also reported. We'll take a look at that chart as well. But first, let's... Um, pull up the Citigroup chart. So Citigroup, you can see nice hollow candle here, but the selling, the real big selling, you can see, uh, and actually let me get the volume back in here. The selling that took place here in December, and the reason I wanted to show this volume, you can see that it was off the charts relative to what we saw the rest of the year. So there was a lot of distribution taking place in December, which made me think the company probably was gonna come up with some not so great earnings, but they did surprise to the upside, at least on the bottom line. And I think that's encouraging some folks back in. Today's volume, almost 19 million shares. We're not to the halfway point yet today. So if we can continue to see movement, especially if we could clear gap resistance, get a little bit above that 60 level with this kind of volume, I think that would bode well for Citigroup, at least in the short term. Now, we do have other banks coming up later this week, and I'll talk about some of those when we get into the earnings spotlight later in the show. But for now, let's take a look at uh, Shaw, SJR. They also came out and reported this morning. They beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line. 
and then they guided in line. So nothing huge going forward. But again, to me, this is a re relief rally after everything we saw in the market. The stock on December 26th was down below 17 and a half. It has now recovered back to 20 and a quarter. And as you look back, we've gone from almost a 52 week low up to challenging multi-month highs here in just the last two, three weeks. So a lot of really good action here in the market in a number of areas. Now the question is whether the overall market can take out some key areas of resistance. So let's talk about the S&P 500 here. Uh, first, the S&P 500 has gotten above the 20 day moving average. So that's certainly a positive. A lot of times when you're downtrending, you will struggle to get through that moving average. But as uh, Aaron was pointing out, 2600 recently was holding a support. We lost that level. Now we're coming back up and testing that area. And if we straight uh, or I should say lengthen this back, I'm going to go back a full year. We'll see that that February low, this is what I was talking about as far as a prior close at 2581. And I think that April first low was, I think it was 2581 as well. 2581 even on February 8th. And then April 2nd, 2581.88. So that, even though we had intraday moves below that, that, that was the lowest we closed until we went into that December sell-off. So now here we are. Currently, the, uh, the S&P is trading at 2583. It, like I was saying earlier, it seems like every time I look up, the S&P is right there. Um, you know, maybe it's five or 10 points above, maybe it's five or 10 points below, but the market is trying to carve out something here. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, maybe it's plateauing and off of this uptrend, we're getting a little flag and the market's going to break out. That would be unusual based on history. Our last four um, correction to bear market moves to the downside have not resulted in this kind of action where we rally, just simply go sideways and then break out again to the upside. Um, those rallies in the past have been anywhere from about 7% to maybe 13%. This one is about 11% right now. So it's right in line with what we've seen in prior breakdowns on the uh, S&P 500 when we get that reaction rally coming back up. So very, very uh, volatile. You remember the VIX reading was down at about 36 at the bottom. We talked about that bottom uh, probably going in um, at that time or certainly in, uh, you know, within a day or two. It happened almost immediately. We got the bounce we were looking for. And now I think this is where um, you know, we're going to find out what this market's all about, whether or not we're going to continue this rally or roll over in the current bear market. All right, I uh, wanted to mention a couple of stocks first. Newmont Mining, they announced that they are acquiring Gold Corp, GG, in a stock-for-stock -stock deal valued at oh, roughly $10 billion. Newmont Mining is the acquirer in a stock-for-stock -stock deal that normally results in dilutive action in terms of earnings. And as a result, the acquirer many times goes down after these deals. You can see that is the case here with Newmont Mining, down 9%. Gold Corp, on the other hand, GG being the acquiree, did gap up at the open, but once it gapped up at the open, it's, since it's stock for stock, it basically is going to track what's going on with Newmont Mining. And of course, Newmont Mining's been selling off. Uh, PCG, we've talked so much about this uh, insurance company or utility. They really were hurt by the fires, the huge fires out in California. And of course, there's been a lot written about that. Um, but now this morning, I think it was this morning, they reported their CEO, Geisha Williams, ha is leaving. And they've also announced the commencement of Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is a reorganization. And that is the reason why you're seeing this huge drop. And that's why when I see these big drops and you see the PPO drop like this, minus 17%, 18%, and then you get these crossovers. While the PPO was rising here, notice the price action was still going lower. The problem was, or the, the reason for it, is that that huge selling momentum to the downside from 50 down to 17, that's unsustainable. So simply consolidating makes it appear as though things were really picking up to the upside. They were not. And that's why you want to be really careful with these companies uh, when they start to show potentially um, positive divergences. Like this is currently a positive divergence. I would not play it that way at all. Um, there were a number of companies that raised guidance this morning. I won't go over those right now. We'll get into the upgrades and downgrades, but maybe we'll have a little bit of time to talk about it later. Just a number of companies either warning to the upside or downside. But Aaron, why don't you go over those upgrades, downgrades? I know you have a few. 
Yep, absolutely. It's quite a long list of uh, upgrades today. The downgrades were a little bit shorter. All righty, let me get all of my info right there. Okay, so um, Intercept Pharmaceuticals today was upgraded by Laidlaw from a hold to a buy. Uh, I wouldn't be buying this. <laughs> I don't buy it. It hit this overhead resistance here at 115, actually didn't even get to 115. You can see that resistance level is formed by the three tops we had back in November and December. And it does line up with the lows in September right here and this high somewhat uh, that we got in August. The, the main thing is, is it got up to resistance and it failed. Yes, there are a few positives on the chart, one being that 20, 50 day EMA positive crossover which is an intermediate term trend model buy signal. But I don't like to see price hit a, a pretty uh, you know, obvious resistance level and then start turning back down. So I, I'm not going to be a buyer of Intercept Pharmaceuticals, despite the upgrade. All right, two organizations, uh, two institutions upgraded uh, Infosys today. And one was Nomura, upgraded from a reduced to a neutral. And Susquehanna upgraded it from a hold to a buy. So we have a lukewarm upgrade and a, a more positive upgrade. You know, I, if I had seen this um, with the breakout, you know, above that overhead resistance and the big gap on that move, I, you know, honestly, I might have looked at that as a, um, a breakaway gap. Uh, the one that starts a nice move to the upside. But the fact we pulled so far back, the only good thing is we are holding that, um, I would call it support at the gap there, if you look in the thumbnail. And we are trading near the top of the range today. Uh, but ultimately, it is a failure at, at uh, resistance. It's in the tech field, which I'm not really that excited about. But you know, you've got a PMO buy signal here. And it's it's not a surprise, uh, but it did come in in a nice fashion early enough to have caught at least part of this upside move. And then, of course, it would have caught this uh, nice giant uh, move that we got recently. Well, it looks like on Friday, actually. Another upgrade for you is Tech Resources. Tech Resources was upgraded by Goldman today from a neutral to a buy. Uh, another you know, somewhat interesting chart here. You know, you have the PMO buy signal. You have, if you look in the thumbnail, and you can really see it also on the price chart, a flag formation. Yes, we hit this area of overhead resistance at the 200 day EMA. And, you know, really at this top that we saw back here in December, but we did poke up above that. Uh, I would watch this one. I would certainly keep it on a watch list see if that flag will execute. Of course, the 50 is below the 200 day EMA. So that puts it in a bear market configuration the way it looks right now. Uh, so you have to consider that we, we're supposed to expect bearish outcomes before bullish outcomes on our chart patterns. But I think this one looks uh, pretty good. And with the upgrade today, not too bad. All right, two downgrades for you, CF Industries. And as you can see on the downgrade, uh, you know, obviously everybody's on board with that as, as this stock CF is down over 2.6% right now. Uh, you know, I, I see the downgrade. I, I'm behind that. I would look for, I mean, this could even be a shorting opportunity for you. You've got that $40 level, super strong support, I would say. Uh, and we're heading back down into it. And the PMO has decelerated. It hasn't quite turned down yet, but the fact that it's decelerating and showing an interest in turning down below the zero line, uh, that tells you there's some, some weakness in that momentum too that was moving it to the upside. So I would honestly, I think this is a good shorting ca candidate. I would be looking for a $40 level. Chevron was downgraded today by HSBC from a buy to a hold. So a, a kind of a lukewarm downgrade. Uh, you know, we managed to get above this resistance at these lows we had back in November. We got, got there and now we're failing and we're back down below them. And you can see those lows match also with the low we saw back in September. So the fact that that level is failing uh, and that you can see that the PMO is starting to decelerate as well under the zero line, like we saw on, on uh, CF Industries, 
we could make a case possibly for a bull flag here. Uh, but, you know, we got to that 50-day EMA. We failed. We might be able to hold the 20-day EMA. You know, I just, I don't, I wouldn't be looking for that bullish outcome on Chevron at this point. I think it, it is time for a pullback. And having fallen below that 112 level, I would look for a move down to that 106, 108 area for Chevron. Those were all the upgrades and downgrades I had. A couple that we did not go over. Aerojet, uh, Rocketdyne, uh, Alcoa, Annaly, uh, News, uh, the, uh, gosh, the news service one. Uh, we had uh, Northrop also. So you had Rocketdyne, uh, Aerojet, and Northrop both being upgraded today. Sherwin-Williams, Snap, Teladoc, NetEase. Other downgrades we didn't go over, Delta Airlines. Uh, Smith Glaxo Klein, PCG, which of course, what a surprise, we just talked about PCG, uh, Teradyne and Western Digital. And I would just say to add to the, the PCG deal, you know, they, they're utility and they are probably responsible for at least one of those giant fires. And, you know, they may, <laughs> the only reason they're not going to go completely bankrupt and not exist is that the state of California is going to, um, well, the taxpayers are going to bail them out to some degree, keep them alive. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a bad place to be as far as that utility. I would uh, stay away as I've been uh, preaching, I think, since the fires. So there you go. Uh, 922, let's get started on our Monday setups. So I hate to, do we really have to look at mine? It was really bad. Mine was really bad this week. I just, I should have shorted it instead of moving it to the upside. Uh, it, it was 27.51 and then we, we had you as a short on NLS. So let's go ahead and I'll, I'll show those charts for us. Yeah, I think your SKM actually bottomed though on Friday. I like that hammer off of that downtrend. It's starting to show a little bit of strength today, so. Yeah, I guess I just uh, got there a little bit too soon. <laughs> it needed to come and test this 200-day EMA, but you know that's a pretty ugly PMO. Uh, 20 getting ready to cross below the 50. Uh, so I got it. Uh, actually, let me go to my the chart that I had annotated for our Monday setups. Here we go. So there it is so i had i mean the good thing is is whenever i do these setups i i mean i will tell you if i'm actually getting in them i think i was pretty clear that i wasn't going to get into this one uh, but i did set that stop at 2675 the painful part is that it gapped down so you know you would have really gotten stuck well below that 2675 level uh, when you got stopped out uh, but you know we are making that move back up maybe to close the gap again but uh and off the 200-day EMA, not bad. But, yeah, I got in too early, I guess. So. Well, and then, it always – it happens. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're trading the market, everybody knows there is no such thing as perfection. And a lot of it is just really about managing risk, making sure you keep, do keep stops in and so forth. But I actually think that chart um, doesn't look bad, and it's in a good space in the market. The market's uh, been doing fairly well. Um, in terms of uh, many of the areas of the telecom, the mobile wireless group. Sure. Uh, and I think I saw, actually, no, I think it was a different report. I was looking at subscribers, but I think it was a different uh, a different company. But I, I just like the fact that the stock continues to go uh, and set higher highs and higher lows. And like I said, that hammer on Friday to me suggests maybe a bottom's in on the stock. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, NLS was the one that I had picked. Um, and I picked it on the short side. It was around 11.18, and right now it's 11, or maybe it's 11.17. I don't remember. It's 11.19. It's pretty much flat. It was down a little bit at the end of last week, but it also went above that 11.20, uh, 11.30 area. I don't know, maybe it got up 11.40 back at the high of last week, um, and it's just kind of sat like the overall market. I mean, the market's not really doing a whole lot, and to be honest, I've looked at a number of these shorts, and I've only been in on the short side with the ETFs. So I just... I'm not comfortable as as comfortable with individual stocks. I think that there there's already enough risk in shorting that I don't need to try and pick the exact company that's going to go lower. But I I still like NLS to the downside. You can see back in late October, early November, the huge gap down with its poor earnings report. 
And after a rally, it went straight down in December. It's getting a little bit of a dead cat bounce on light volume. I suspect it's going to roll over, but just keep your stops in play. Last week's intraday high, I think, definitely marks an important area now of resistance. If it went above that area, I would, I'd probably be bailing on it. Yeah, that 11.50 area you can see was support even all the way back from February. So, yep. uh, let's see. Okay, well, it's uh, time to get a fresh start, thankfully for me. Yep. Wipe that slate. Clean. <laughs> what do you What do you got this week? Okay, so I have. First of all, I do want to show you one of the ones I did have last week that I sure wish I had picked was Denny's. Oh my goodness, this one would have been just great to have. There you go, Den. Look at that nice parabolic move there. I have to say, if if anybody happens to be fortunate enough to be in Denny's right now. Uh, I would be uh, making, I would be tightening up my stop right now because that's a parabolic move to the upside. And when it does fail, likely it'll be a big gap down and a big move to the downside. But right now it's still looking pretty good. So I would just tighten that stop. But wow, I wish I'd picked that one. <laughs> yeah, we always have those. Yes, the yes. The one that got away. I know. I, yeah, it happens. I, I'm not always good at this. So, all right. Um, let's, well, nobody, like you said, no one's perfect at this anyway. No. All right. So my first one, uh, I'll show you the ones I, I have as longs, and then I have two shorts uh, that I put on here as well. So, uh, you know, usually when you see my Monday setups, you're going to see a move that is very, uh, that's been going on for a day or two of the PMO rising and not necessarily having that crossover. I like to see stuff that might just be on the edge of breaking out here, you know, a sleeper in a way with my uh, momentum. But as you can see with the last pick I did, you know, sometimes the timing is just slightly off. But I like um, American Tower. It is in the, the REITs uh, real estate area, which I think is going to do well, especially if we continue lower into the week which I suspect we will. So I thought this one looked uh, rather interesting to the upside. Not my pick. Getty Realty Corp. And it was really interesting. I ran my scan and I did. I got a lot of REITs and a lot of healthcare, um, but I'm, I was very picky about which ones I chose. So we're on a nice little rally here for Getty Realty. And you know, we, we went ahead and broke above that overhead resistance in the very, very short term at about 29.75. And so far we're holding it. We managed to get above the 20 day EMA. Uh, the only thing is is the momentum on this one is, it looks like it might be decelerating somewhat, um, but I think we you might be able to squeeze a move out to the upside uh, to, to at least challenge that top we had back in December. Uh, because you can see that short-term breakout, and it does appear to be holding that level. The other one, uh, Thompson Reuters, TRI. And you saw Newsday was uh, upgraded, so I thought it was interesting that Reuters came up as my uh, Reuters came up for my uh, pick, my Monday setup pick. I really like this one. I almost made this my pick this week. Uh, you have a nice little double bottom in the short term coming off of a decline. These are reversal patterns to the upside. 50 is well above that 200 day EMA. So it's okay to start looking, you know, it's okay to look at uh, bullish outcomes for this. And I think you could see, look for a move up to that $52 level. I would set my stop probably about $47, $47.50. Uh, mainly because for me with double bottoms, you get this rising uh, bottoms trend line on them at the end there usually, or you can connect the two bottoms with a, a rising bottoms. This is of course on the, the double bottom. So as long as that rising bottoms trend line doesn't get broken to the downside, I always consider the pattern still valid. So we could see it come back down below 49, uh, below that confirmation line that we currently are above. Uh, but we, it, as long as we don't bring that, uh, break that rising trend, I think this uh, double bottom could still be in play. And interestingly enough, if you do the measurement uh, and add it to the confirmation line area, it amazingly comes up right to overhead resistance at 5150. So again, I think this one is setting up uh, nicely for an upside move. Ventas uh, was another one, another REIT that came through. 
And this one's got the little short term breakout from a trading range. Uh, now above the 20 day EMA, 20 is now turned up above the 50. Nice looking PMO, OBV looks good. Well Tower was another one that I looked at and this was also in the real estate. And I didn't ask for it to look for REITs. I really didn't. My scan was the general scan. So I, I think it is quite interesting that most of them were REITs uh, and it is a defensive area and we have it as far as the market hit some overhead resistance. So I think that uh, it's telling us something. Uh, you got a breakout here above, um, just above these tops we had back here in November uh, that coincide with these short term bottoms in the top right there. Uh, I like the breakout. It is pausing. It actually has moved down over a half percent. So we're getting the pullback toward that confirmation line. Uh, so I thought this one looked very interesting, except the PMO is starting to flatten. So that was one I didn't pick. Limited brands was a short. I think it's pretty obvious why here. We've got a, a failing PMO buy signal at this point. Um, you can see that this area of support slash now resistance is holding strongly. Uh, and so I would be looking that downturn. I would look for a move down to below $24 right now on limited brands. Huh, but here's the one that I picked, FRC. And this is a financial, it is in the banks. And I know right now, today, they're doing very well. This is a good day for them. But I don't, I don't see this one as, uh, I, I'm looking for it to make that turn down. I'm looking at it right now and I had put in my uh, support resistance line here at just about 85. And as you can see, we're currently just under 85. You know, if we close well above 85, then I would I would certainly change my mind on this one. Um, but I have the stop set pretty tightly at about 86 uh, because if we can get back into that trading zone, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want it anymore. Uh, but we got the breakdown, closed below that level, the 85 level on Friday. And like I said, the PMO is starting to look ugly. I'm looking for a move down to $80 on this short. And at the time I did it, I was at 84.23, but I notice right now it's at 84.86. So I might just take that little, uh, <laughs> I'll take that if, if that's okay. All righty. Wow, it's quiet. Did y'all hear me? Did I? Yeah, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, I was waiting You're for. You're just so stunned by my beautiful picks. That's I didn't. I wasn't sure you were done. I didn't want. To oh yeah, yeah, I did my pick. I'm going to adjust this though for the right, um, the right amount. So. Okay. All right. So you're going with FRC. I am going to go with Terex, T E X. So I've got this chart up, um, and I really just like the uh, area of resistance here at around thirty dollars for a couple of different reasons. Number one. You can see that the PPO has gotten right back up to the center line. And as it approaches that center line, if the downtrend continues, a lot of times that PPO will roll over near the center line. Also, you can see we are struggling right here at the 50 day moving average near $30. Prior lows were around $30. And then after breaking down below 30, you can see the gap down here. There were struggles getting back above 30 on that reaction. You can see all the volume here uh, on the selling in December. So we're coming back up much lesser volume. Also, if you notice the RSI, anytime you're in a downtrend and you get that RSI back into that 50, 60 area, that tends to be where you fail. Unless, of course, the downtrend is broken. In that case, you want to make sure you have your stop in play. But I think this 30, 30 and a quarter area right in here is going to be really difficult for Terex. Unless, again, the overall market just surprises us and continues moving higher. But I'm looking for it to roll over and I think Terex rolls over with it. So I'd short it current price, maybe add a little bit if it gets around 30, 30, 10. And then I'd probably keep a fairly tight stop. I think an intraday move above 30, 50 or so would probably have me out of this trade. Um, and I would be looking for it to roll over, lose the 20 day moving average and make another run for the recent low down here in December, down below $26. So that would be my pick for this week. So that's the one I'm going to go with. Uh, some other stocks that I liked as well. And again, all of mine are on the short side assuming that this market is going to roll over at this key resistance area. Now, obviously, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, there's no guarantees. We could see the market just continuing to move higher and 
you know, confound most everyone. But I think we're going to roll over. So that's why I'm focused on shorts this week. Baker Hughes, BHGE, came up. You can see these highs. And I wrote about this one in my blog this morning. And initially, I was going to go with it. But earlier when I was looking, it was down below $23, which was almost a dollar off its recent highs. So I would I prefer it if it gets closer to $23.75, $24 even. Because off of this selling here, you can see that reaction high went just above $24. Here, a couple more reaction highs between $23.50 and $24. So I think as you get closer to 24, I really like the reward to risk on the short side. TKR, this is uh, Timken. Another one's got two major tops here at about $42 just above, and we're getting close. Nice rally from 34 up to 42, but can we get through this key resistance area? CONE, this is Cyrus One. Stock's been downtrending for quite some time. You can see the first test in January of that 20-day moving average. I would call that a pretty big failure. And you can see multiple tests of $53. You close above 53, I think you can, at least for me, I'd probably moved back to the sidelines and cover. But anything from current price up to 53 looks like a good reward to risk on the short side. EXP, this is Eagle Materials. Eagle Materials also in this long-term downtrend. Another one with the PPO getting very close to that centerline resistance. The uh, RSI got right up to 60, and you can see throughout this downtrend, this is the highest that the RSI have got, has gotten to. Previous pushes just above 50, and you can see the, the stock rolled over. So I think this is going to be a key area for EXP. Now, the volume on this one was a little bit stronger on the way up. I don't know that that necessarily means we're going higher, but it means I want to make sure I keep my stops in play in the event that it breaks out. So this is another one that I prefer short around 67, 67 and a half, and probably with a 1% to 2% stop in play. Downside, however, though, if it rolls over, loses its 20-day moving average, I think it's got a little bit more downside. And let's take one more here. Let's look at MAS. Uh, MAS, you can see on the reaction high early December, $33. Went all the way back down, put in the double bottom. You don't want to see this stock clear 33, especially on a close. So another one where I think you can keep a fairly tight stop. Right now, you got a downtrend followed by a flag. But if it breaks above that reaction high here with a double bottom in play, that would be my sign uh, to cover. Uh, this is another one. The volume has been pretty good on this move to the upside. So that was another reason why on a breakout, you would want to make sure you have your stop in play. Failure, though, and especially an intraday move above 33 and then weakness to close back above th or below 33, that would be a really nice reversing sign and a suggestion perhaps that we were going to move lower. So some, those were just a few stocks maybe to keep in mind as we go forward, but I'm going to go with Terex, TEX um, on the short side. And here are our Monday setups, the summary. So Aaron is shorting FRC at 84.86 tight stop. I'm shorting TEX 29.58 tight stop. And we shall see what happens from there. Yes, we shall. All right. Hopefully it'll be a better week for us. But, you know, sometimes when you're on the short side, you really need the market going in your favor. So I would say if, as long as the market continues to be resilient, hangs in here, or even possibly moves higher, that would make it very difficult for shorts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one reason why I don't like to short. I just, I, for me, and, and you know, trading is so emotional at times. And the worst feeling for me is being in a short while the market's going up and my short getting killed or at least just losing money doesn't necessarily even have to be killed. I just don't like losing money when the market's going up. Yeah. I think there is something uh, mentally about with about shorts that are just that way, because you just know that you have complete and total potential for a very giant loss because there's no ceiling really. Yeah. So, well, I'm glad that you said that it was a mental thing with shorts because I thought you were going to tell me I was mental, which I wouldn't. Well, we knew that already. I don't need to state the obvious, you know. So I, I wouldn't have necessarily disagreed either. I probably would have joined in. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, keep moving. Next up is earnings spotlight. So I thought what I'd do today, I mentioned earlier in the show that there were some companies that had raised guidance, lowered guidance. I'm going to go through and just go, uh, just pull up the charts on a number of these stocks. So that we can take a look. Uh, now, again, these are warnings either to the upside or to the downside. Lululemon, uh, L-U-L-U, -L -U, taking out these recent highs here. 
It did get up to the prior uh, early November high around 145 in reverse. So we got some work to do the upside, but they did raise their guidance this morning. You can see the volume heavy stock up more than 6% today. Can we get through that resistance area? This is the type of stock that if I was bullish um, and I've got raised guidance, I'd wait. And if I could get this thing back down anywhere close to this 20 day moving average and recent lows, that's where I can manage my risk the best. And I already know as the companies come out and raised guidance. So I'd keep the stock on a watch list. And if things start to improve in the overall market, this is the kind of stock that I would be interested in owning in the, in the event that the market continues to strengthen. Um, another one, Crocs. We talked about Crocs being one of those footwear stocks that's been on fire. Even though they came out and raised guidance, you can see the stock is down today. And what this is telling me is that it's already built in. So this is another one. They're raising their guidance. They're pulling back. I think if you get this back down close to 29, I think Crocs would be a pretty interesting entry. Next up, Shoe Carnival, SCVL. I'm sticking with a common theme here. Uh, nice gap up. They also raised guidance this morning. Taking out this double top, which was good, went all the way back down, filled its gap, and starting to strengthen off of that. This is a stock that's not that far away from the highs that it saw back in August and again in November. And given the overall market, um, you know, we've talked a lot about consumer discretionary. Uh, I know I've written about it a lot. We've talked about it here on the show, but this is the one aggressive sector that has continued to outperform the S&P 500. And we're seeing it in some of these warnings, these positive warnings uh, that we're seeing like Shoe Carnival, Crocs, and so forth. Uh, another one, final one that I saw, and there may have been a couple others, uh, Neo Photonics NPTN gapped up. Looked like it was struggling, you know, earlier it was struggling, went down below the 20 day, but it has rallied back nicely. And this is one that's trying to challenge that overhead uh, center line on the PPO. If it can uh, strengthen, I think the fact that it's back up above the 20 day is a good sign. I think this has a shot to fill that gap up at 775. So NPTN looks interesting, although it is a small cap and uh, you got to expect a little bit more volatility there. All right. In the other direction. Tailored Brands, TLRD, lowered guidance. Stock was already getting beaten up. And then they came out, lowered guidance, continued moving lower. We might see a little rally off of this because I do expect that a lot of this is built in already, but not good news here. AXTI, small, small technology company, American Extel Technology, also lowered their guidance. But look at the downtrend. This wasn't a shocker to anyone. And notice when you look at something like Crocs that we pulled up, Crocs was in that major uptrend, and then they come out and they say they're going to report better than expected results. You get these stocks in downtrends, many of them coming out and saying that they're going to miss expectations, and uh, so it shouldn't be a shocker. The question here technically is whether or not we close below this $4 level because we opened above support, went below it intraday. If we could get back up and close over 4 405 I think a lot of this weakness might already be built in, and I'd look for another pushback up to about that 450, 460 area. Still the overall downtrends in play. It's not a stock that I necessarily would be overly excited about for a longer term trade, but short term, if it can hold on to the support level with that bad news today, that could be a bottom in the very near term. Uh, the last one I wanted to mention that missed or lowered expectations, prestige, uh, hum uh, consumer healthcare, PBH, another one in a downtrend. This rally that we've seen in the market really didn't take PBH up very much. Stock at its low was just below 29, got up to about 32, so maybe about 10%, but that's a little less than the overall market. Many, many stocks were bouncing, you know, 20, 30, 40%, not PBH. And then we get the warning today, look at the volume pick up, and this one gapped below the prior low, which tells me probably is going to head lower. All right, uh, upcoming earnings. We got a bunch of those. Um, you know, we talked about Citigroup kind of starting things in terms of earnings reports. Well, we still got a bunch to go and uh, they're just getting started. So let's pull up some of these that we'll be reporting later this week. So I think you're gonna recognize a lot of these names. JP Morgan um, with the Citigroup news and with Citigroup moving higher, banking was actually earlier anyway, was the best performing stock or best performing industry group in the market um, or at least within the financials. And uh, we're seeing JP Morgan rising here, trying to get through that 102 area. You can see the low back in October, also at 102. So this is going to be a pretty important pivot area on the chart. We'll see whether or not JP Morgan can get through. If it can't, especially with its earnings, and I think those earnings are tomorrow, 
then we got some issues. UNH, United Health, also will be reporting. Notice the lows coming across here in October. We're at about 255 intraday down in the low 250s. And then after breaking down in December on heavy volume, we moved back up and our reaction high was 250. I think this 250, 255 area is going to be really important for UNH. And with earnings, we're going to find out which way it goes. Uh, Wells Fargo, WFC. <clears throat> Again, with the overall banks moving higher, had a nice move, sideways consolidation, nice little flag. Looks to be trying to break out of that, but the volume is not confirming. And when I get these, these pattern breakouts, I really like to see the volume confirm the moves to make me feel really good about the, the uh, pattern confirming. In this case, volume is much lighter than it is, say, on Citigroup. And as a result, I'd be careful, especially if it leaves this tail to the upside and comes back down and fails. This hasn't been a very good bank performer for a while. So Wells Fargo had to have some question marks. UAL, this is United Continental. Um, and this has been one of the better airline stocks. This is one that I have no problems with on the long side. You might look at this and say, well, it really hasn't bounced off of that low. But when you look at a longer term chart, I'm going to stretch this out to a year. I think what you're going to see is a stock that's actually been a pretty darn good performer um, throughout the year. It broke to a new high at the beginning of December. So obviously it was one of the better performers. And if you check this out, look at these lows coming across here at about $78, $79. Great support right in this area. We had a hammer print last Thursday. It just seems like this is an area where the stock could make a move. Now, earnings are coming up. I don't like to hold into earnings. So it's not a stock or a trade that I would make, but I wouldn't be surprised, especially with that move below support, I wouldn't be surprised to see a better than expected report out of uh, UAL. We'll see. Bank of America, back to the banks. BAC coming out with earnings later this week, breaking above the 50-day moving average. PPO trying to go positive, but we are in this gap resistance zone. And you can see 26.75 acted as uh, support back in November. We lost that support on very heavy volume, and now we're back into that area. So this is another one that's right at a key pivot point or potential pivot point. Let's see how their earnings come in. Goldman Sachs GS, this has been a loser for a while. I don't like the stock. I think this po this move back to the upside is an opportunity to get out. Uh, the volume was extremely heavy, not just in December, but this selling started all the way back in November and it had to do with, um, uh, I don't remember the whole news story, but I remember that they had done something not, um, it was in one of their funds in one of the foreign countries. I can't remember the details. But uh, the stock sold off hard. That's when it started back in the second week in November. Ran from 230 all the way down to about 150 and now has bounced a little bit. Look at the volume dwindling as we make this move to the upside. I think Goldman Sachs rolls over. CSX, just a few more here. <clears throat> CSX, big one in the railroads. Um, now, railroads to me are always important because they give us a pretty good um, indication of what the market believes about our domestic economy. There's only one reason for railroads to go higher. It's not because of shipments to Europe or Asia. Uh, we know that railroads are confined here to North America. So it gives us a really good clue as to what's going on in the U.S. So that's why I wanted to include it here as a, a report that we really need to watch this week. Let's see what CSX, not only what they report, but what they say about the upcoming quarter and maybe about fiscal year 19. Uh, I think that will say a lot about uh, maybe what, where the S&P 500 is going. All right, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, TSM, um, in a downtrend, kind of has a little bit of a positive divergence here, but you can see we've had 50-day tests. We've gotten close to the center line. We're still in this downtrend. We've gapped lower today. We're underperforming. I don't know. This one doesn't look very good to me. I think volume trends are still weak. Um, semis overall have just not been very good performers. I expect that this report could be a little ugly. Netflix, what a rally we have seen in Netflix since the bottom on December 26th. It just continues to do well. It's in, well, it was uh, part of the uh, consumer discretionary area. Let me see where we've got Netflix. I want to take a look at the, the its peers. It's now in the internet space. I think it was in the specialty retailers before. Uh, but anyway, um, Netflix being part of the internet group, 
probably was taken down a little bit more than it should have been based on other internet stocks and the way they had been performing. But uh, Netflix is rallying. The overall group trying to, to establish a new high and start an uptrend. Hasn't quite done it, though, yet. Still, Netflix has been one of the better performers, certainly, in the internet space. And I think that rising 20-day moving average we want to watch on any pullback. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up right there. A um, couple other stocks that probably are at least worth mentioning that will be coming up later this week. IBM, American Express, which is AXP, Schlumberger, SLB. Um, so we're going to be... You know, we're going to be under the gun here over the next few days as a lot of these big companies report. And then as we get into next week and the week after, we're going to start seeing, well, we'll see other first tier companies, but then a lot of the bigger second tier com companies will be reporting as well. And uh, that's going to give us some direction, I think, as we head into the next quarter. Because I, I don't know about you, Aaron, but I think that the market has already factored in that the last quarter was not going to be good. I mean, that's what we saw in December, the huge selling. So I think what the market's really looking for is direction on, you know, from guidance on some of these big companies, what they're seeing, not only in the first quarter of 2019, but also what they see throughout the balance of the year. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we both agree with the kind of technical analysis we do that most of the time, uh, all of the news and all of that is pretty much baked in early on a lot of this. I know we talk about the Fed and getting all excited about all of that, but a lot of times you don't see a big movement just because people have already thought about it, think they know which way it's going to go, or there's this news story. So I, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I, I'm really interested in seeing what's going to end up happening into the rest of this week. I really am. I, I suspect it's going to be bad, but, um, you know, if it's good, boy, that's going to take some interesting turns on my analysis. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I think just about anybody calling for a bear market is this, you know, if the rally continues, you got to sit back and say, okay, uh, is this going to be different than times in the past or, or yeah. not? I mean, I'm, I'm still leaning definitely to the bearish side at this point, but I, you know, it's been kind of impressive with the market gapping down the last few days that it continues to, to, to move back up. So, yeah. Well, it was interesting because I did a post uh, on my uh, Twitter account. I tweeted uh, and about 2,600 being my level. And Dan Russo, of course, from uh, Chaken Analytics, he made a comment. He was like, you know, Aaron, I'm right there with you. He says, but it seems like almost everybody is. And so that's what worries me. <laughs> well, and when you look back at some of these bear market rallies, they don't always hit you know, I, I try to look at them objectively and say, okay, on this breakdown, where would I, I expected it to go back to? And sometimes these rallies go a little bit further than you think they're going to. And then all of a sudden you start questioning your bearish thoughts and mm -hmm. you maybe start leaning a little bit more bullish and then they pull the carpet out from under yes. you. So something yes. to, to keep in mind as we go forward. Yeah. Especially if this, you know, the bear continues, that's for yep. sure. All right. 10 and 10. We did get quite a few symbols uh, since we're just getting started just a little late. I, I'm going to skip the RRG, uh, but we did have a lot of requests. Honestly, it was kind of funny. A lot of them you ended up covering or I ended up covering at one point or another. So it should be interesting. Okay. Well, let's First get it started. one is, what did we say? Cube. Yep. Cube Smart. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is real estate or REIT. Um, yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, annotated this one, so take let's take a look at it. And uh, I'm I'm short term bearish, but I'm not necessarily long term bearish. First of all, it is in the more defensive real estate area, so that is good news. I don't I'm not looking for any kind of major downside here, but I don't like today's candle. Now the the day's not over, and maybe by the end of the day we'll be back up near the high, and then I'll like the candle a lot more because you got pretty strong PPO. And if you can get through that 20-day moving average, I think that would start to add some bullishness to this chart. But if we fail, what I would suspect is that we'll go back down, at least test the low at 28, possibly go back down and test this low around 27, which in my view is a much bigger support level. And if we did that, because that PPO is rising, any kind of a move back down, either to test this 28 level or maybe even the move back down to 27, likely would have a positive divergence in play. So, I mean, you take a look back when we tested this support area in October and we bounced, you see that PPO start to turn up 
and then we go back down, we put in the double bottom, and the PPO remains a little bit positive, and then we strengthen off of it. So I think something like that could develop. Uh, we'll have to watch, but uh, to, let's see where we finish today. If we if we close below the 20 day with that intraday move above, I'm going to be a little bit more bearish in the short term. All right. The most popular in the chat room is Crescent Point Energy, CPG. All right, CPG. Well, we're at a key area of resistance. We're at the center line on the PPO. We're at the 50-day moving average. Very, we were incredibly oversold. Um, you know, a couple of ways to look at this. Number one, you could say, well, the stock's been sold off so much that it just needs a, maybe some relief and a rally. And I would say, okay, maybe I'll buy into that. Um, but the other thing is the volume has not been light on this selling. So there's something going on. There's been a lot of sellers, a lot of distribution in the stock, and the rally back to the upside has not really been that strong. Um, I mean, you might say, well, it's moved from 260 to 350. That's pretty good. That's 33%. But I'm talking about off of this move down in just three, two and a half, three months. Uh, this kind of a rally, if we were to maybe draw Fibonacci, and why not? Let's go ahead and just do that. But you would see that uh, from the high, down to this low, we're basically back to only the first, uh, actually, we're not even to the first. The first Fibonacci retracement is 38.2%, which is all the way up at about 418. So this has been a weak rally so far. I'm, I'm a, little, a little bearish on this one. If it can break above 350 and get some volume behind it, maybe you can short-term trade it. But until that happens, I personally would avoid it. All right. Let's see. The next one I have for you and I think this would be interesting anyway. Uh, it's the ProShares uh, short of the QQQ, and the symbol is SQQQ. Clever. Short mm -hmm. QQ. Um, I, you know, I don't know, maybe watch the trend line. Again, I would be just watching the QQQs, and as they get back to a key resistance area, that's when I would put on a position um, on this now. I could draw a couple of different support lines here, um, but I'd probably look maybe here at the trend line. So if we connect the lows from there to there, I mean, my guess is somewhere around this 14 level, I could put one more support in, which is the December lows that we saw here around 14, kind of coincide with this trend line. Um, I, I still think the market is going to go lower. That would be my, my guess. I think that the odds are, greater that we're going to roll over and maybe go back and retest those lows. So I would be, I would tend if I was going to trade uh, on the long or the short side, it would be on the short side. And I think the closer the SQQQ gets to 14, the better I like the trade. All right. Next one up will be, let's see, CRON Kronos Group Biotech. Yeah, and I think their cannabis stock, I, this is one of my favorite ones in that space, actually. It is up against resistance, so I think you got to be careful with entry here. But this is a stock that is in a very bullish configuration, in my view. Um, not just in terms of price action with this now triple top and the rising lows, but also look at the volume trends. It looks to me like there's a lot of accumulation taking place. But every time we get a move back up to 14, you can see how quickly it's moved down. So that's why I'd either need to see the breakout to the upside or I'd be looking for at least a pullback down to, say, that rising 20-day uh, moving average. So I'll put a little arrow in there just as a reminder. But, yeah, this is a stock I think looks pretty good. Um, I just don't want to get it right at resistance. All right. Let's see. The next one up will be uh, we haven't looked at NVIDIA in over a week. So let's look at that. Yeah, this is one that uh, obviously is just not performing well, even on a relative basis here the past two weeks. It's a nice bounce, don't get me wrong. But considering how far it dropped, this, is not, this isn't anything like Netflix or some of the others we've seen. So I have my doubts here. I do think that there's a decent chance maybe we'll get back to that 50-day moving average um, and maybe to the recent early December high if the market were really good uh, for a period of time. So I'm going to say maybe that 50-day right there, and then you've got the top at about 172. So somewhere in there, I would expect would be your your um, kind of maximum 
move back to the upside. I'd be surprised if we get through just because, again, that the overwhelming volume to the downside, I just think it's going to take a while for NVIDIA to work through the oversupply. So I think we bounce, continue the bounce. If we roll back below the 20 day moving average, I'd be out of the stock because I think it'll go back, retest the bottom. But as long as it stays above the 20, I'd maybe be looking for this 160, 170 area. Okay, let's see next one up, uh, WTR, alkaline water. It's uh, consumer discretionary, special consumer services. W-T-E-R. Oh, W-T-E-R? Mm-hmm. Like water. <laughs> All right. Uh, not familiar with this one. Obviously, big volume coming in. Uh, I can just look at the chart and just tell you, and you probably can see this for yourself, incredibly volatile. Stock was 550 second week of December. It was 250 by the second week of January. Actually, 250 literally as the new year opened. And now it's rising again on big volume. So I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. I don't know what's going on with the stock, but I would just say looking at it, you've got to be ready to experience some incredible volume. And I think uh, the, the biggest areas of support resistance are pretty easy to identify on the chart here. I think you got 250 up to 550. We're sitting at 370 now, 65, and we're up 17% today. I could not trade it here just in good conscience, trying to manage risk. I think we could get a gap fill, maybe back down to 320 or so. <clears throat> so that's a level maybe I'd look for. The 20-day the moving average is at 323. So I'd be looking maybe for a pullback into that area. All right. Let's see next one up. Uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper, KDP. Uh, don't like today's candle. Um, but overall, we've got a nice uptrend and gap support continues to hold which is what I would uh, probably continue to focus on. But there you can see the gap up that occurred in late October. Uh, we went back down, tested that, put it in a double bottom, and now starting to move higher again, PPO strengthening. What I would probably look for is if we do keep this reversing candle in play, I think we have a chance to maybe get back to that 20-day moving average in the near term, which is at 25.86, another 2% lower. If I was short-term trading, I'd look maybe at that level. If I wanted to, to maybe build a position over a little bit longer period, then maybe I'd see if the market weakens, maybe I can get the stock back down around 24 and a half. Okay, let's see. Oh, and my goodness, of course, somebody had to, I think they've been re reading too much of Greg Schnell, but uh, GM is the next one. And they, says, does, they said, does GM have the gas to perform or does it need a tune-up? <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to say in the short term, you know, it looks pretty good. I wrote about the autos in my um, blog this morning. I'm not a fan of autos. I just think that over time, if you look at a long term chart, and as soon as I annotate this, I'll show it to you. The autos just have gone nowhere in the last five or six years. So I would be watching, first of all, overhead resistance. You've got gap resistance and recent price resistance, 38.75 to 39. Um, volume was good on Friday on the gap up. I think they raised estimates on on Friday uh, before the open. Uh, so I think it's got a shot here at 38.75 to 39, but I wouldn't be too excited until it broke out. So let me, okay. You know, I'll, I'll bring up that uh, auto chart just so everybody can see what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. So if we go back and take a longer term look at the monthly chart, this is since 2013. The autos. That's why I always say Tesla is probably the only auto stock that I would consider trading because it's a little bit more volatile. All these other stocks have just been, they go up for a period, back for a period. You really just can't get a good sense of a trend over a long period of time. So I would avoid GM personally. All righty. Let's see the last, no, not the last one. I'm sorry. Uh, AWK will be your fine, not your final one, your second to the last one. All right, AWK, another water stock. Um, yeah, I don't like the failure at uh, 91 and also at that uh, top of that candle from December 24th. So let's uh, annotate, I'll draw this line across where I'm talking right here. It's had a huge red candle. It's taken us basically three weeks to make up, get all the way back up to that candle. That's where we were on Friday. Notice also we failed at the 20-day moving average, and now we're starting to put in a lower low. I think this one's going to roll back over and maybe maybe make a run for either the 86 and a half area or I'm even going to go a little bit lower 
down to the more intermediate support at around 85 and a half. So I think the trading range right now is 85 and a half to 91. So if I had to take a position here, it'd be on the short side. All righty. Last one. And I mentioned it as an upgrade, but I didn't cover it. Uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne, AJRD. Yeah, um, good short-term movement here. Volume trend's not bad. Um, this was an earnings beat that came out at the end of October. So all in all, I think the stock has held up well, and I think, you know, and it should hold up well. I've mentioned in, uh, on several prior occasions that when you get these big gap ups on heavy volume with earnings and you get a filled candle like this, when you come back down, the top of gap support tends to hold and you don't look for it to go all the way down to the bottom at least in, unless it breaks. If it breaks, then of course I'd look for the bottom. But here you can see outside of intraday moves to the downside, 32 and a half has been a great area of support on the stock. So I think that continues to the upside 39's resistance. I probably wouldn't buy it here because you're closer to resistance than you are support. And you're also just as close to resistance as you are the 20 day. But if this stock were to pull back closer to $35, I like it on the long side. All right. Let's see, uh, that does complete the 10 and 10. All righty, here are the symbols that we just uh, went over uh, that Tom annotated. Just go to the blogs tab from your member homepage, click on the Market Watchers Live blog, and the link to these charts will be right there at the top. And of course, I do put it in all of the Market Watchers Live recaps that I publish. All right, time for our final market update. Let me guess. S&P 2582. Actually, almost a little bit higher. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yes, markets open much lower on a gap down. They are trying to recover right now, as you can see. But we are. it looks like we might be stalling out here, at least for the Dow, right at about 23,950. You've got the S&P still trying to get up toward the 2600 level actually i mean just making it to 2595 would be a a victory at this point but i i think we're pausing right now i don't know that we'll be able to continue the push upward into the end of the day similar situation for the nasdaq gap down starting to move up s p 400 looking a little better but uh, this is what i'm talking about we're getting up to the intraday highs and now we're starting to pause and fail at that level and you can see the same thing happening with the russell 2000 hitting in that intraday top right there and it's starting to pause and possibly fail at that point tsx is up slightly right now up uh, 0.12 percent treasury yields are almost unchanged here at 2.702 percent the vix did rise but it is starting to pull back just a little bit currently the reading is at 1919 UP, the dollar is down slightly. Gold had a nice big gap up, pulled way back, but it is trying to make a move back toward the intraday high. USO, uh, oil continuing the slide that we saw that started on Friday, uh, mostly consolidating sideways though, but it looks like we might set an uh, intraday low and a low that would certainly be um, below what we saw on Friday. So something to keep an eye on there. Uh, bonds, TLT, the 20 year treasuries uh, ETF, you can see that we are getting this pullback again from Friday, like we were seeing in uh, some of the other markets here. And now we've hit an intraday low, might be bouncing up off of this 12040 level that was the low from uh, Thursday. That's all I have for my market update. Uh, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Tom, and get ready for sentiment. All right. Uh, yeah, I've got an hourly chart up here of the S&P 500, just going back over the last month. And a couple of things to note. Um, usually when you're in an uptrend, I always follow the rising 20 hour EMA for maybe clues that things are just getting a little bit too far ahead of itself. And uh, that's what we saw at the end of last week. As we kept trying to push higher, you can see the hourly PPO rolled over and it actually continues to move lower. But price action is doing almost nothing. And uh, the volatility as a result is, is winding down because if you look at from high to low each of these days, it just keeps getting narrower and narrower and narrower. You know, back when we bottomed on December 26th, uh, 26th, we had this huge rally. We pulled back on the 27th. If you compare the lows each of these days, intraday lows and intraday highs, 
most of them not only are at one percent, but but many of them are two and three percent um, uh, variances between intraday highs and lows. And now you look at it and it's just squeezing and getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And I said earlier, I'm not quite sure what to make of this, because normally what we see is when we get to key areas of resistance, the market tends to snap back quickly to the downside. And instead, we're getting these initial gaps lower. This is the third morning in a row, but we are rallying back off of these lows. So I don't know. It's just uh, one of these things. It's it, you know, the market's always a little bit different. Never likes to to show you its cards, and uh, we just kind of have to keep evaluating it every day. I'm still, you know, we've been talking about still a little bit bearish, and I'm expecting it to go lower. But each time it looks like we're breaking down, we get this steady move back to the upside, which suggests somebody is buying, and that was completely different than what we saw in December. So, anyhow, that's all I had. So we will get into sentiment. And that ought to be interesting with all the uh, rallying we've seen the last couple of weeks. What's that? Tell yes. Me. This is one of those weeks where I have to say uh, people have one opinion about what the market is going to do. And yet their money isn't following their mouth. So <laughs> let's go ahead and take a peek here. All right. So here's our sentiment update for January 14th, 2019. Today, we are going to go over, these are the charts I always go over for sentiment, but we will look at those 10-day moving average of the put call ratio, the American Association of Individual Investors, AAII, we're going to take a look at their poll. We will take a look at the National Association of Active Investment Managers name. We're going to look at what their exposure is to the market right now. Ride X ratio, this is the money where the mouth is. So we'll be, that's a really interesting chart today, I would say. Wall Street sentiment survey, uh, this is the market timers survey that uh, we take on Friday after the close. So I'll show you the results of that. We'll look at the VIX, and then finally we'll finish off with some gold sentiment. So let's go ahead and get started with exactly that. All right, make this bigger. Okay, so as I said, the first one we're gonna look at here is the put call ratio. And I invert my scales. You'll find that I'll do that on, on uh, various charts. And, and I do it because my mind thinks of low readings as oversold, meaning bullish. And I see the top as being overbought, which means bearish typically in my mind. So that is why I switch it because to me, when you get the put call ratio very high, that implies a lot of bearishness. And so you would expect at that point uh, a bullish market result. Uh, right now we are topping and we do not want that. As you can see, similar tops when we've had them result in price decline, sometimes extraordinarily deep and ugly. And I would say that being in a bear market at this point, this, this situation, I think we're even more vulnerable to the downside if we see these tops. So the only good news I would say about this is they are, they really, these tops haven't completely, um, well, I mean, they have top, but we're not seeing a conviction of a top and moving down just yet on the put call ratios. But I would have to say that we are topping and that in my mind is bearish for the market because that means people are, are bullish and sentiment is contrarian. All right, AAII, remember this is the poll. Uh, pretty much anybody can take if you go to their website, aaii.org. And you can see we certainly do have a preponderance of bears, but a third out there are still bullish. So what I look at is the bull bear ratio. And you can see with in the thumbnail especially, uh, you know, we are rising just a little bit with that bull bear ratio, but we're still seeing clearly more bears than bulls at this point. Uh, so I would consider these readings on the bearish side, obviously, uh, as far as the market participants go. And that honestly is bullish for the market. Now, given the fact that we're in a bear market, I don't always expect the bullish outcome here. Um, but this is what I'm looking at at this point. So actually, let me make sure this looks like it might not be correct. So let's go and make sure. There we 
go. Yes, there we go. See, I knew there was something wrong here. So we have less bears, more bulls right now. Our bull bear ratio is up to over one and a quarter. When we see people feeling more bullish, that is bearish for the market. Look at the, the decline right here in the bearish uh, results of this poll right now. You can see each day or each week going further down and we're seeing more bullish uh, activity here as far as participants go. So when I look at this chart, when I see a lot of bullish uh, activity, uh, as far as the poll goes, that is, we have a contrarian indicator and that means short term, that is bearish for the market. All right, name exposure index. All right, so this tells us how exposed to the market active um, investment managers are. And I think that this is important because two things go on here, and I'll talk to you about this a little bit with the Wall Street sentiment survey. Uh, the money managers do tend to be on the right side of the market at the beginning. It's at the end when we start seeing the exposure um, getting very high and starting to pull back. That's when those readings in my mind become pretty suspect as to what they're telling us about the market. Right now, honestly, we are sitting at a neutral reading just at about 66, 67, uh, as far as exposure goes. That's, a, that's bearish on their parts in, in general when you look at what happened through the majority of this year. It would definitely be on the more bearish side as far as exposure. But the fact that you know the market is starting to uh, you know hit 2600 level here, it didn't quite get there, it was turned away. Uh, I'm not surprised to see exposure levels uh, rising just a little on the the rally but you know they are still pretty neutral sitting there in the middle so i i don't think this is telling us too much but i do pay a lot of attention to what the investment managers are doing because a lot of times they are on the right side of the market it's just after some time some you know you you might see it sort of peter off as far as uh how they're doing in their exposure and when they start to move it out that's when we really want to start looking. They're moving it up right now, but not by a lot. They're still sitting in neutral. And so that means that as far as investment managers go, I would say they're really sitting in that neutral position overall. So Wall Street Sentiment Survey, this is a weekly survey. So it's very, very short term. Uh, market timers are given uh, a, an email uh, from the wallstreetsentiment.com, uh, Mark Young. And we tell him what we think is going to happen next week. And to be honest, let me get this ratio and make sure that you see how these charts are not quite on the right date here. There we go. All right. So last week, everybody was very bullish going into the week, including myself. And it did. It turned out to be a pretty good week. Uh, like I said, a lot of times timers, because it is just uh, one week away, I don't necessarily look completely at it as contrarian uh, because they do tend to be, like I said, uh, we kind of tend to be on the right side of the market here as far as our uh, sentiment goes. So right now we are seeing a lot of bearish activity here. Uh, you've got 20% are bullish and half of the survey participants are bearish and that would have included me as well. And when you look at the bull bear ratio, you can see it's very low right now. What we want to see then is a, a move to the upside, right? Because we're seeing sentiment is very bearish right here. The caveat, like I said, as with the investment managers, is that a lot of times they're on the right side of the market. Uh, I am looking for a decline going in, but I think all of us would say if we had, if we get above 2,600, or in this case with the spy, 260, uh, you know, then we obviously will have to evaluate, but I reevaluate. But I'm looking for lower prices, uh, as are most of the market timers right now. Okay, so here's the right egg analysis that I found very interesting. Notice the huge decline in the money market assets. So, well, let me first of all give you a little bit of understanding of the chart before you really get into this. So, you know, Rydex, uh, well, Guggenheim has a basket of funds uh, that used to be managed by Rydex. And 
what we did is we we discovered that you can actually I'm looking okay that's good that you can uh, get the assets from them so we can check every night how many assets are in bear index funds they also report the assets in the money market funds and then the um, bull and sector funds so what we like to do is find out where the cash flow is going you know where are we moving uh, in what direction and you know, we pulled way back on our money market. So a lot of uh, folks were in cash, uh, like myself, <laughs> continue to be mostly in cash. But a lot of people pulled out their money from cash, and you can see it moved into equities. Now, you can see we, we got a little bit of action on the bear funds. But really, when I look at this, I would say it's mostly flat for the week. And what we really note at this point is the money market assets moving much lower and the equity assets moving much higher. That tells me that despite taking a survey and thinking that uh, you know they're they're you know mostly bearish, there's a lot of bearish uh, sentiment. Yet the money is telling us that they're feeling pretty bullish right now because we are getting the money being more uh, reinvested into the market a bit more at this point. Alrighty, let us look at uh, gold and we'll look at the gold sentiment. We determine the gold sentiment. What we do is we um, check the Sprott Physical Gold Trust and they tell us uh, where they calculate the premium and discount on their fund. It's closed, it has a certain amount of metals in it and so it has a worth based on you know, what's going on, you know, it's, it has a worth, the gold has a particular um, worth to it. But the fund, you know, people buy a lot of it and pay for um, it at a higher price, then there it's a premium, they're buying it at a premium. Uh, and if they get it for a lower price than actually what we're looking at for gold, then it becomes a discount. So it means that people aren't that interested. Uh, it, when you start seeing discounts, that means people are very bearish on it. They're not getting in uh, into it as much. Uh, so we're seeing a pullback right now in the gold uh, discount rate. So we're seeing a pullback. We could even see it move back to the positive side if interest level continues for gold. Uh, but right now we're seeing a little bit of a consolidation going on in gold. This is GLD and you know we've had a nice rise but we've kind of stalled out here. It looks a lot like a pennant uh, or you know in the short term a symmetrical triangle. Those are continuation patterns so I would expect it to move to the upside. Not liking the PMO on gold right now though. Uh, you've got that turning over a bit but it's flat. I mean, it's flat like price. I'm still looking for a, a nice move. And then notice GLD also had a 5,200 day EMA positive crossover. That's a long-term trend model buy signal for gold. So I am definitely bullish on gold. And finally, let's look at the VIX. And like I said, I invert my scale on the VIX because I'd like to see oversold versus overbought. To me, oversold is very high VIX readings. That means people are very bearish. And when people get very bearish, that turns out to be bullish for the market overall. And that's what we saw back here. But what I'm pointing out right now are the tops in the VIX. You know, we get very low and then we top and start, the fear starts to rise a little bit more as you start heading down. Now, back in earlier in December when it topped, it happened below its moving average. Now, at least we got through that uh, we didn't quite get to the upper Bollinger Band. I was expecting to see it get up there uh, by the end of uh, last week because we were seeing some nice moves to the upside in price. Uh, however, it never did. And now it looks like it might be turning over and topping uh, below that Bollinger Band. So I would say that as far as uh, you know, the VIX goes, it's telling me that uh, we were very bullish. We're now starting to get a little bit more bearish as the VIX now starts to turn over. And that, like I said, is overbought to me. We had very bullish activity. We had a bullish sentiment uh, that's bearish for the market. And now we are starting to see the fear starting to rise. So I think it's just one more case for prices moving lower up until the end of the week. 
And like I've marked right here, you can see these other tops that we've had previously on the VIX and how they do line up in the short term, typically uh, with a decline. Not necessarily one that lasts for a long time. They're very short uh, indicator moves, in my opinion. It's why I use it on my ultra short term chart. All right, so that pretty much covers it. Uh, let's see, I can get back to a, let me get back to a slide that we need to have here. Whoops, new share, there we go. Back here, do, do, okay. Sentiment update, there we go. So here's my summary on all of this. Uh, topping ratio is bearish for the market. Um, at this point, and I have to change that, we had very bullish sentiment going in it, and that would be bearish for the market. Uh, name neutral readings, I think that's neutral for the market. Wall Street sentiment, sentiment was highly bearish, but I think that that's bearish for the market this week. I think that uh, the market timers are gonna be on the right side this time around. And let's see what else we had here. Right X ratio, disappearing cash assets, rise in equities. That's um, actually, yeah, that's bearish for the market. Uh, breadth topping below the Bull Bollinger Band, bearish in new ter near term and gold. Uh, you know, we're still looking at bullish um, setup for gold with that long-term trend mile model buy signal as well. And that concludes the sentiment update. So I don't know, we, we probably should look at that poll, Tom. I'm curious where you are on the, on the scale here. Well, I do have an interesting stat for everyone, because you know I follow the market pretty closely going back many, many years. And the best time of the year for the stock market has been the October 28th close or 27th close through January 18th. And of course, this Friday is January 18th. And if you go back over the last 35 years, not including this one, the last 35 years, 32 of those years on the S&P 500 have been higher. You've closed on January 18th higher than you were on October 27th close. This year could be the fourth time that we are down over that period in the last, that would be four out of 36 years. Um, we need to go up to 26.58. And right now, our last check, we were at 25.87. So probably about 2.8% uh, we'd need to rise this week from where we are right now in order to um, avoid only the fourth decline out of the last 36 years over that period. So just kind of highlights a little bit how weak this has been. This is not normal for the stock market to perform like this November, December, January. No, absolutely not. I think more uh, more information for the bears. Yep. Yep. I will say the last two times, though, that this happened, uh, you might say, well, does that mean that the rest of the year is going to be bad? The one time it happened, which was 2001, obviously 2002 was not very good. So that uh, was a problem. But the last time it happened was 2016. And of course, we had a huge rally after that. So 50, mm -hmm. 50 I guess. I would say I'm going to go in the lower camp, though. I mean, I, I've been saying I'm bearish. I think this is a key area for the market. I don't like, from a bearish perspective, I don't like the fact the market keeps bouncing back, though. It tells mm -hmm. me there are buyers out there every time we try to roll over. Be careful if we break out. I will be on the short side, that's for sure. Absolutely. I have to totally agree with you there. And tomorrow, I'm sure we'll have more to talk about as far as this. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, we got a lot of earnings coming out. Talked about that earlier. So that's going to be really important to watch to see how the market reacts to some of these earnings. Citigroup came out. It seemed like the market was saying, okay, well, there's a little relief here. Citigroup didn't, you know, drop a bomb. They were a little light on the revenue side but beat on the bottom line, no major warning. So something to keep in mind as we go forward. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It's located below your video player. We'd love to get your feedback and hear what you think of Market Watchers Live. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great afternoon, everybody, and we will see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.